If you think about colonialism 1.0, it's the same mindset of conquering and subduing nature that leads people to go and conquer and subdue other people. So they came and conquered and subdued India. Fine. Okay, they they hung Indians by the lamppost in the just a hundred years ago. That's how Indians were being treated. They were being hung by the lamppost for defying the British. Okay. So that was colonialism 1.0, the direct form of going and subjugating and oppressing other people, saying that I'm superior to you and I can do what I want. Then in the 1940s and 50s, all these countries got independence from the European powers. So we were all told, hey, you have independence now. So you, colonialism is over. Congratulate yourself. You are now independent. But in reality, did the European powers suddenly have an attack of conscience? And this is why they gave everybody independence? Or did they figure out something? What they figured out was that they don't need to go and directly oppress people in order to subjugate them and extract from them. They can do it indirectly. And they did it indirectly through these mechanisms that I'm going to show you. And it has to do with dairy and animal agriculture. So this is Operation Flood, and this was funded by the European Economic Commission and the World Food Program. The European Economic Commission and the World Food Program gave India a bunch of money to go and extract biomass from the forests of India, turn that into milk, and sell the milk in the cities. They told them, you know, if you do that, there's a lot of people who want to drink the milk. Okay, then you can sell the milk and make money. And then you can sell the beef and you can export it because Indians don't eat beef. So you can export it and make money. And with that money, you can then go buy fossil fuels because you can only buy fossil fuels with dollars. And to get dollars, you have to have something that people who eat, who, who are in Europe want, Europe and North America want. So this is what I call, you know, you ask why are why are the Europeans you know promoting dairy consumption in India? More than half of Indians can't even digest dairy. They can't. They're lactose normal. Sixty-five percent of the world population is lactose normal. So it's the Europeans who had this genetic mutation that allowed them to digest dairy even after infancy. Okay, uh, digest lactose even after in infancy. So they are taking their food, which they are able to digest, and imposing it on other people, saying, eat that, eat that, it's good for you. That is colonialism 2.0. That is colonialism 2.0. And that's what's been happening. Okay? So through this mechanism, through the mechanism of the economic structures, the currency mechanism, you're still subjugating the global south. You're still extracting from the global south. In fact, the estimate is that we're ex extracting, the global north is extracting two to three trillion dollars worth of resources from the global south every year through these mechanisms. And that's colonialism 2.0. And colonialism and carnism are just two sides of the same coin. So eating animals, eating animal foods is directly connected with colonialism, is directly connected with capitalism. It's all one single oppression. That's happening. Okay. And nature is telling us it's over. Stop that. Get real. And that's what climate change is. Because human activities have done a lot of damage to the biosphere, the ecosphere, the um, atmosphere, and, and the hydrosphere of the planet, mainly through deforestation. So you think about this forest, I mean, this desert from the western edge of Africa goes all the way into India and becomes the Thar Desert, goes all the way into China and becomes the Gobi, Gobi Desert. It is one contiguous desert, and that's where the ancient civilizations of the world were. So this colonialism is nothing new. It's been happening for thousands of years. It's just that now it happens to be headed by some European people. Okay, Otherwise, it was other, we were all doing it to each other as human beings. And the poor animals <laughs> were at the bottom of it. They were bearing the brunt of all this. Okay. And so through animal agriculture, we con converted forests into deserts. 
fundamentally. And if you look at what is happening today to the land of the planet, okay, uh, the IPCC has broken it up and showed you, showed us how much land is being used for different purposes. This is uh, urban land, there's irrigated cropland, and you can see all these you know, bar graphs showing this. I said, okay, I'm gonna take the bar graphs and put that on the map to show you what the equivalent would be. And here is what it is. Okay? So the, I'm leaving the deserts where they are. So the, this is the desert that I showed you before. And plant foods would cover pretty much uh, Af Australia. And that constitutes 85% of the food we eat already. So already 85% of the food we eat comes from just land area that can be fit inside Australia. Okay? And that's all the plant foods we eat. Now, 12% of the food we eat is, is land animal foods. And to get that, we are using land that would cover all of Europe, almost all of Asia, and a little bit of Africa. This red blob. Okay? It's actually 43% of the land area of the planet we use just to graze and feed our animals. This rest of Africa would correspond to biofuels, which again, they call it biofuels. <laughs> because we are growing, we are growing all this uh, vegetation and then burning it okay? instead of taking fossil fuels. And we think that that's better than burning fossil fuels. It's actually worse because this biofuel region could have been a forest, right? All our built land, urban land, can fit inside Madagascar. And then timberland with cover most of North America and most of Central America, all of Central America and a little bit of South America. The original forests are just 9% of the ice-free land area of the planet and they can be fit in the bottom half of South America. So timberland, wild animals cannot live because it's just monoculture of trees. Wild animals cannot live where our, our domestic animals live because you'll kill them if they come near our domestic animals. They don't live in deserts much. They don't grow, live in our cropland. So the only place where they are allowed to live are here, original forests. So this is why wild animal populations have been decimated compared to what they were 10,000 years ago. Now to get the remaining 3% of the food we eat, we are actually destroying the entire ocean. Okay, we are actually bottom trawling the ocean. We are, I mean, we just the devastation in the ocean is worse than what you're doing on land. So this abuse of the earth has got to stop. That's the signal that we're getting from other nature and that is climate change. This is why I say, you know, climate change, we can see that as something terrifying or something that is telling us to wake up. It's a wake up call. Between 1970 and 2010, we wiped out 52% of wild animals, wild vertebrates by weight. So that's what we have been doing to the biosphere of the planet. And that, when, I, when that report came out in 2014, I did an extrapolation based on the assumption that the rate at which we are killing wild animals is proportional to the size of our economy. And that showed that by 2026, we are on track to wipe them all out. And I was so shocked. I said, what, 100% by 2026? That cannot be true. Why isn't everybody screaming about this if that's true? So I thought maybe my calculations are wrong, you know, so I'm gonna wait till the next report comes out. And that came out in 2016. And it said that between 1970 and 2012, we wiped out 58%. So from 52, it went to 58 in just two years. So then I realized 2026 is real. Okay, we are on track to wipe out 100% of the wild water graves by 2026. And that evening I was reading a story to my granddaughter in bed. And at the end of the story, she asked me, uh, Grandpa, who are the first human beings? And I have promised her that I'll never ever lie to her because I think lying to children should be a crime against humanity. And I made that pledge because I realized that I had been lied to as a child about the protein myth, the calcium myth, I mean, all these myths that we were taught in school. And I was so upset about that, okay? So I told her I will never ever lie to you. And so when she asked me that question, 
I told her, okay, I'm going to explain to you how evolution works. Imagine that you're standing on the street and you're holding your mama by your hand. When you ask your mama to bring her mama to stand by her side and so on, and you create a long line of mothers on this side of the street. And on the other side of the street, you ask a chimpanzee to do the same thing with her mother and her grandmother and so on. By the time these two lines go from Phoenix to Tucson, they would merge because both lines are going to say, hey, that's my mama too. Immediately, she just sat up in bed and she said, what? Are you telling me that animals are my family? And I said, yeah, now that you put it that way, they are your family. And she said, then, 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 then why are people eating my family? Grandpa, make them stop. They're eating my family. She started bawling. You know, and it was my job to put her to bed. And, and I had this five-year-old, instead of you know, going to sleep, screaming at me and yelling. And, and I told her, Kimaya, you know, I'm trying. Honey, I'm really trying. In fact, it's my job to make them stop. So immediately she stopped crying. She looked at me wide-eyed. She said, this is your job? This is your job? You know you haven't done your job? When will you do your job? She started demanding. She said, when will, when will you do your job? And I told her, I better do it by 2026. Otherwise, we're all in big trouble. She said, will you promise me that? I said, yeah, sure, I'll promise you that. She said, will you give me a pinky promise? I said, sure, I'll give you a pinky promise. And I had no idea what it meant. She said, hold out your pinky. And I did. And she locked her pinky in mine. And then she said, you can never, ever break a pinky promise. And then she went to sleep. And I couldn't sleep. Because I realized I had made a very serious promise to a little girl. And I thought at first, who am I to make this promise on behalf of all, all human beings? And, but then I finally dozed off. you know, And I woke up in the morning realizing that as a systems engineer, it's my job to figure out how to do it. It's my job to show you what we need to do in the system to transform from where we are to where we need to be. So that's when I started the Vegan World 2026 project. And I went around talking about this to people. Now, the Living Planet reports come out every two years. So the Living Planet report of 2020 is the latest one we have. And it said that between 19... 70 and 2016, 68% of wild animals died out. So we are on, still on track to hit 100% by 2026. So it is urgent that we get to a vegan world by 2026.